Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Department of Energy's launch webinar for our Pathways to Commercial Liftoff. These uh, liftoff reports represent a department-wide initiative to strengthen engagement between the public and private sectors to accelerate the commercialization and deployment of key clean energy technologies. Beginning with three technology areas, clean hydrogen, advanced nuclear, and long duration energy storage, or LDES. These first three reports were published today at liftoff.energy.gov. I'm Lucia Tien, Senior Advisor to DOE's Chief Commercialization Officer and quarterback for these reports, and will guide us through this webinar. On our agenda for today, first we'll have uh, David Crane, uh, Director of the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, provide some opening remarks for the, and some context for the liftoff effort. Then uh, we'll be joined by Vanessa Chan, Chief Commercialization Officer and Director of the Office of Technology Transitions, and Jigar Shah, Director of the Loan Programs Office in a virtual fireside chat to explore the content of the first three reports. And finally, in the second half of the hour, we'll provide a deep dive into the insights from the Clean Hydrogen Liftoff Report. Further webinars covering long duration energy storage, advanced nuclear, and other future liftoff uh, topics will follow in the next weeks and months. With that, David, over to you. Th thank you, Lucia. Um, I want to start by thanking everyone listening in for your interest in the DOE efforts to implement our very substantial portion of the Bill, IRA, and CHIPS Acts, which in aggregate represent more than a half trillion dollars of clean energy and climate investments over the next 10 years. As Lucia mentioned, I'm the director of the Office of Clean Energy Demonstration, or OSED, as we call it. OSED is the biggest of several program offices within the DOE, which have been stood up since the enactment of the bipartisan infrastructure law to enter into public-private partnerships formed for the purpose of demonstrating at scale critical emerging clean energy technologies including programs focused on each of the three technologies that are subject of the liftoff reports made public today, advanced nuclear, long duration energy storage, and clean hydrogen. These liftoff reports are in many respects the product of the fact that the clear intent of Congress underlying Bill and IRA is to expand one of DOE's traditional missions of funding the demonstration of new energy technologies at scale to funding demonstration projects that will provide enduring value to American energy consumers because they are commercially and financially viable and because they are developed, constructed, and operated in close collaboration with our host communities. In the case of hydrogen, which Lucia noted we will be focusing on today, our $7 billion solicitation which is currently underway is intended to help fund six to 10 hydrogen hubs, which will serve as the pillars for a clean hydrogen economy and will in turn swiftly catalyze a powerful second wave of purely private sector investment in hydrogen that will complete the foundation of the national clean hydrogen economy. Under the terms of the legislation, the government provides up to 50% of the cost of these H2 hubs which means that our $7 billion needs to catalyze at least $7 billion of co-investment from the private sector, and hopefully a great deal more, as obviously we wish to stretch the federal funds as far as they can reasonably be stretched. We also need to de-risk the hydrogen hubs to the extent necessary to attract private sector project sponsors, because consistent with the entire history of the American energy industry, these hydrogen mega projects are going to be developed, built, and operated by the private sector, not by the federal government. As we like to say here at the DOE, the clean energy transition will be private sector led and government enabled. And in this regard, I believe that the fact that the hydrogen liftoff reports clear eyed enumeration of the challenges to achieving the commercial viability of clean hydrogen as a core virtually inexhaustible domestic clean fuel source should give great comfort to our prospective private sector partners in this hydrogen hub endeavor. In that the hydrogen liftoff report sends the signal uh, 
that the DOE recognizes that the challenges to be overcome in making clean hydrogen happen and is going to work with the private sector hydrogen hub sponsors and with their and our state and local government government partners to de-risk these projects for the benefit of all. One final note before, before I hand the mic back to Lucia, the role of the DOE when it comes to clean hydrogen is not only to enable a private sector led clean, clean hydrogen build out and commercial transition, it is to accelerate it. The history of commercial adoption of coal, oil, and natural gas as primary fuel sources in the United States is that in each case, it took more than 30 years for each of these fuels to become just 10% of the overall national fuel mix and from 40 to 80 years to get to 20%. I think we can all agree that we don't have that kind of time now. The Biden administration objective of a zero carbon power sector by 2035 is now just 12 years away. The objective of a net zero economy is 27 years away. And it's hard to see how we get to either without successful commercialization of clean hydrogen. In summary, the hydrogen liftoff report is a key element in our attempt to accelerate commercial adoption of clean hydrogen by demystifying it. The difference between technologies that are considered immature versus those that are deemed mature often comes down to the wide availability of accurate, unbiased information. As living, breathing documents, which will regularly be updated to reflect what we are seeing at the DOE, and which will also take into account the feedback we hear from you, it is our aspiration that these liftoff reports play a pivotal role in our common national goal of deploying clean energy solutions at unprecedented speed and scale and in a manner that benefits all of the American people. Lucia, back to you. Thanks so much, David. Um, I'd like to now welcome Jigar and Vanessa to join us on camera. Vanessa, you there? There we go. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, Jigar. Welcome. So uh, we'll spend a good amount of time today um, on the clean hydrogen topic. But first, maybe let's start with a peek at the other two reports that were published today. Uh, Vanessa, the Long Duration Energy Storage, or LDES, report makes clear those technologies are still a little bit uh, earlier in the commercialization process. What do you see as the role for LDES, and how do we get to liftoff? Thanks, Lucia, and uh, welcome everyone to this really important time uh, for the Department of Energy with the liftoff of these reports. And uh, LDES, I think, is really critical uh, to the clean energy transition. It has enormous potential to really help support the high renewable penetration because it helps us to overcome intermittency when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing while simultaneously improving our grid resilience. And this will then let us reduce the need for new natural gas peakers and improve energy security by diversifying our supply chains. Uh, Lucy, as you mentioned, you know, LDES technology is still maturing and investors are still cautious. And there's uh, over 100 LDES providers spanning a wide range of technology types, which are really vying for this market, which is exciting because it gives the sector a lot of shots on goal. Now, to get to liftoff, um, the LDES technologies are really going to require public and private investment to drive down costs and market intervention. And this is something you're going to hear across all the reports that are coming out. And we need this in order to compensate uh, LDES's value and services to the grid. What's the business model that we have in order for the technology to scale to industrial level? And there's really three key areas of action that we need to get us there. First is the technology cost and performance improvement, uh, which we need to achieve via grid scale demonstration projects, starting immediately with the most near term applications to achieve competitive costs and operational performance. And what we found is we need uh, between 45 to 55 percent of capital cost reduction and 7 to 15 percent of round trip efficiency improvement from where we are today. Second is market and regulatory evolution where we have to provide market compensation for LDES services of at least 75 kilowatts uh, uh, per kilowatt year. And we need this in order to enable LDES uh, deployments at both the state level um, and the ISO level. And 
Lastly, uh, we really have to drive flexible and rapid supply chain formation, expanding to about $330 billion by 2050 and 10 to 15 gigawatts of annual deployment by 2035. Um, this will require collaboration with industry and local play demand. And so overall, uh, this support is going to uh, accelerate commercialization through technological progress, including reduction of current metrics and um, uh, such as round trip efficiency. And I think the big take home for all these reports is that we really are in all hands on deck time, not just for LDES, but for nuclear, as well as for, uh, L, um, for uh, hydrogen, uh, because we really need all of us to get together to do this. And for LDES, we will need continued public support, such as DOE's LDES pilot and demonstration funding from Bill, uh, the Energy Storage Grand Challenge, which was done a few years ago, and Long Duration uh, Storage Shot, which was one of the first um, earth shots that was uh, mentioned and rolled out here at the DOE. And most importantly, we need private investment. So uh, all in all this, you'll hear the theme from today. It's all about uh, the ecosystem needing to get together to help us drive towards uh, commercial deployment. Thanks, Vanessa. We are certainly all hands on deck here. Um, and the commercialization outlook, I think, looks a little bit different for each of these technologies. Uh, so what we need to do is a little bit different. Jigger, uh, there might be some folks in the audience wondering, do we need new nuclear to get to net zero and what does liftoff look like? Yes, <laughs> likely 100 to 200 gigawatts in the US by 2050. You know, I think uh, advanced nuclear has a clear value proposition as a clean, firm power source to complement renewables uh, on the path towards decarbonization goals while creating high paying jobs with concentrated economic benefits for communities most impacted by the energy transition, such as coal communities. Nuclear power is also highly compatible with unionized labor and up to 80% of existing coal power plant sites may be eligible for advanced nuclear plants, allowing utilities to invest in a new plant to repurpose the existing footprint while preserving and expanding high paying jobs in local communities. Coal to nuclear transitions present critical opportunities to ensure an equitable transition to a decarbonized grid. In addition to the work DOE is doing on advanced reactor demonstrations to achieve liftoff, we need to accelerate deployment of near-term technologies, which require generating a committed order book of over 10 reactors of the same design by 2025. And mind you, I said order book, not MOUs or letters of intent. Uh, or great press releases, um, you know, and building a delivery model to ensure the first builds are on time and on budget. Waiting until the mid 2030s to deploy at scale would lead to missing targets and or a significant supply chain overbuild. How we get there? Utilities are afraid of uncontrolled overrun and project abandonment risk. Catalyzing the order book will require intervening to manage completion risk. Things like overrun insurance, tiered grants, and government ownership or offtake. Project delivery for the first reactors needs to actively incorporate Vogel lessons with potential EPC partnerships as have been announced already by the Ontario Power Group for their new reactors and the Tennessee Valley Authority. Industrialization will require large scale financing, low cost debt from the loan programs office and programs like labor recruitment, training, as well as engaging early and often with communities and workers to provide clear information about these technologies to address concerns and to align with local priorities and needs. Thanks, Trigger. So having gotten the teaser for LDES and nuclear, um, maybe let's turn to our focus for today. David, you mentioned in your opening remarks that the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations is investing $7 billion to establish up to 10 clean hydrogen hubs across America. What insights do you hope that private sector actors across the hydrogen value chain will gain from the Clean Hydrogen Liftoff Report to inform their own investments in the hydrogen economy? <laughs> Well, we'll see it. There's a lot of insights. So that's why probably the first advice I would give to everyone who's listening in is read the whole report. Don't just read the executive summary. Um, uh, if people knew that what you and others went through to take that report down from hundreds of pages to uh, 
to, to just double digits, they, they'll realize that there's a lot to unpack in, in these reports. And I know the rest of this webinar is going to be about hydrogen. So I, I would just sort of group it into three things that I think are important. First of all, there's, there's uh, the common challenges in terms of how the hydrogen uh, industry, the emerging high, clean hydrogen industry uh, relates to the outside world. A lot of that is safety, the reality and perception of safety. Whenever you're talking about a new unfamiliar energy commodity, there's the question, you know, of, of you know, how safe is the handling of that going to be? And there's obviously the physical safety. There's also the environmental impact. As uh, scientists like to say, hydrogen is an elusive molecule. So the question of hydrogen leak leakage is a question that all of us are going to have to answer to the other. Uh, the second uh, group of challenges that I would say that I would focus on is, is, is the challenge of transportation and storage, um, or as we like to call in one term, the connective tissue. Um, you know, we expect to have hydrogen hub bidders bidding both for inside the fence hydrogen uses and also for a usage like for heavy duty uh, land transport, which of course is, is an outside the fence solution. So, so the report has a lot to say about uh, that. And of course, uh, that's a key part of the solution to, uh, to land transport is moving the hydrogen around. So as we look at our H2 hub bidders, we're going to be particularly interested in looking at those who have solutions to the to the connective tissue issue. And finally, and probably most importantly, there's the question of offtake. And you know, the nature of energy in mature economies is that demand tends to rise in small increments every year in fairly predictable uh, ways. But supply is added in chunks through mega projects. So, so, so imbalances between supply and demand in energy is not new, uh, but it's uh, but it's particularly acute when you're talking about a new energy commodity like hydrogen. So, we at the at at OSET are looking at various ways in which we can support uh, um, the offtake side where. We're looking at things that other countries that have hydrogen programs are doing. But first and foremost, uh, we eagerly await the hydrogen hub bids on April 7th because, you know, we always uh, take second chair to the private sector when it comes to innovative solutions. And we look forward to seeing uh, what solutions that various prospective H2 hub bidders have in terms of creating uh, and supplying uh, offtake solutions and then see where we can fill in, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to make projects even stronger. So that's what I would say. Thanks, David. And a, a follow up for you. These reports talk about the commercial pathway to liftoff, um, but that's closely tied to the societal impacts of these technologies. Um, and, and you've mentioned some already. In this pivotal moment leading up to liftoff, what role can developers and investors play in driving an energy transition that is equitable? Well, I mean, the first thing, and, and I said this on the last webinar we had about hydrogen, is that there's a very well-defined community benefits section of our solicitation document of our FOA. And, and I said last time that people bidding should take that seriously because we take it seriously as part of the Biden administration's Justice 40. And so I would start by reiterating that. Uh, you know, what, what an equitable solution has multiple elements of, of it. And, you know, I, I run the risk of not covering them all. But, you know, I would say on the question of skilled labor, I, I, think, I think there's full alignment between uh, are the DOE and every at least corporate leader that I've met that the, the absolute essential role that skilled labor has to play and, and the perception that we have a scarcity there that's gonna have to be addressed is, is something that I think we're all aligned on that, that uh, skilled labor is a key stakeholder in this. I think the, the one other part of the equitable solution that I would mention is just you know, if we look back historically, you know, the, the burden of, of 
supplying energy in the United States has has fallen heavily on on you know um, on on select communities who basically enabled modern life for all of Americans, but haven't always uh, enjoyed the benefits uh, you know of of in 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 proportion to you know what they're supplying to the rest of America. I think as we plan for the next generation of of energy in the United States. We want the energy communities that agree to host these production uh, facilities and these mid-market facilities to, to, to participate fully in the benefits of, of the value they're providing to the rest of Americans. Thank you, David. So the first three reports are out. Again, for those who have joined partway at liftoff.energy.gov. Um, Vanessa, can you tell us a little bit about what's next? Well, first of all, I want to say that these are living reports, are uh, you know replicating uh, and reinforcing what David said. Uh, anyone who's spent time commercializing technology knows that it's not a linear approach. And what we know now in terms of data is going to be outdated even potentially six months from now. And so as a result, uh, it won't be like, oh, DOE published a report in 2023 on hydrogen. Let's go back and look at that. These will be living, breathing reports where you should constantly be going to liftoff.energy.gov if you haven't uh, to take a look at what the latest is. It'll be constantly updated. And so that's, thing, that's one thing I want to stress is that you know if you download it once, you don't have to look at it again. You should be constantly going to this website, bookmark it as your favorites and wake up every morning and take a look at what we've done there. Um, but really these three technologies are the tip of the iceberg. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's an all hands on deck situation, but it's also all technologies on deck situation. And uh, what we want to do is ensure that we're looking at all technologies that can help towards the president's uh, ambitious climate goals and uh, lay out what you have to believe for us to actually drive commercialization for these really critical technologies. So next up, uh, we are also uh, looking at carbon management, which includes uh, both CCUS and uh, direct air capture. We also have an effort on industrial decarbonization, including chemicals and uh, cement, where we'll be deep diving into those, since those both play a very large role um, if we're able to drive to our clean energy goals uh, on how do we uh, get us there. And then uh, lastly, something that a lot of us think about is the grid. And so one of uh, the things that is the secretary's favorite is virtual power plants. So what are ways in which we can think about creating virtual power plants through things like vehicle to grid, where you can have vehicles that you are uh, charging at night, driving them uh, to work, and then having them uh, discharged to the grid. And for example, we just uh, have been spearheading an MOU on vehicle to grid uh, with a lot of ecosystem players thinking about how those can be weaved into a virtual power plant. So um, all in all, you know, here at the deal, we were busy on any technology that we think can help us transition to clean energy. And we will continue to be working on these uh, liftoff uh, pathways to really help catalyze the ecosystem. So all of us are on the same page to know what we need to do to get there. Great. Lots more to come. So uh, we have just four minutes here and maybe a last question for all three of you. Uh, what's one thing about the, these pathways to commercial liftoff that you want to make sure that folks take away? And maybe I'll start with you, David, then Jaker, then Vanessa. Well, I mean, the one thing that I would emphasize is, is alignment in the sense that I, I think the pathway reports uh, show that the DOE has a recognition that the introduction of any new energy technology at scale is not a linear path. It's a winding road with speed bumps all along the way. And, and the DOE uh, seeks to be fully aligned with pri the private sector, which understands that historically much better than the government does. And that we wanna be uh, you know, the best partner in that that we can be and bring the full force of the federal government uh, to help solve problems as they arise along the way, because we know that they will. Baker, your ads. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, what I'd add here is, I think, as Vanessa suggested, the liftoff reports aren't exact, aren't an exact roadmap of what we think should happen or what industry should do but instead they are the product of an ongoing conversation that public and private sector uh, capital allocators must be having. So we get this right and make the clean energy transition more effectively. 
I also want to emphasize what David talked about earlier, that the clean energy transition is only going to be possible if we as a country can build a skilled workforce that's equipped to power these new sectors and earn the support and buy-in of frontline communities. Achieving commercialization and deployment at the scale we've outlined in these reports will require the skill of hundreds of thousands of American workers. Private sector employers can attract and retain a reliable workforce by creating high paying, good quality jobs, by investing in development and training, and by supporting the transition of displaced workers to new clean energy jobs. And jobs are just one of the benefits these emerging technologies can bring to Americans. These developments will reshape the country's energy system, creating opportunities to bring health, environmental, and economic benefits to frontline communities if they're developed in line with community needs and priorities. And lastly, I just wanted to emphasize that right now is the most exciting time for clean energy in the history of the US. Uh, with uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, the uh, Chips and Science Act and the Induction, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, we have half a trillion of dollars that we can use to buy down risk for the 23 trillion in the private sector. And really uh, it's critical that the ecosystem, that we all get together to figure out how to do this. There's not one single organization or one single entity that can get us to lift off. We need everyone to be working in concert, which is why uh, the three of us felt so strongly we needed these type of liftoff uh, reports to really get everyone aligned. And it's really important to know that each of these technologies are not going to lift off independently of each other. In different situations, they are complements to each other. And there's no substitutes or competition across it. And you know, it's kind of uh, a joke I make, which is it's similar to like Pokemon. You got to catch them all. We need them all. <laughs> and they're all going to play an important path um, to net zero. And it's not that we are going to be focused on one versus another. So just like your kids, you don't have a favorite. We don't have a favorite technology. We want every technology to succeed. And we have to move in concert so that we can all holistically get this. And so I think the you know thing that David opened with is we can't wait. So don't wait, don't sit there and do the catch 22 and say, well, I want to see, you know, be a fast follower. If you're a fast follower, everyone's a fast follower, we're never going to get there. So hopefully these reports will help you guys move because if you don't move now, we're going to miss the boat and you're going to be left on the pier uh, waiting and wondering what happens. And we don't want you to do that. So jump onto the boat. And if we haven't talked enough, liftoff.energy.gov is your ticket onto the boat. And so we hope you go there often because the boat will be leaving many times. Thank you, Vanessa, Jigger, David. Um, and uh, thank you also to everyone in the audience who's joined us today who is surely motivated to move. Um, so in the second half, uh, we'll turn next to a deep dive on the clean hydrogen liftoff report. Uh, a run reminder for everyone, please do go to liftoff.energy.gov. Um, all three uh, liftoff reports that were published today can be found there um, and we will be uh, doing deep dive web webinars into the other two topics in the coming weeks. Um, I'll now turn it over to Hannah, Jay, and Jill to introduce themselves and take us through the Clean Hydrogen Insights. Hannah, over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Lucia. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for sticking with us here in the second half hour. My name is Hannah Murdoch. I am a senior advisor and contractor in the Office of Technology Transitions. I've had the privilege of working on our clean hydrogen report over the last few months with several colleagues who will be joining me today. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to Jay and then to Jill to introduce themselves. Hello there, I'm Jay Munster. I'm the Director for Analysis in the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. Hi everyone, my name is Jill Capitasto and I'm an Energy Justice Liaison in the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. Great. Thanks, Jill and Jay. We're excited to talk through our findings from the report with you today. Um, and as many have noted, I hope that you'll go ahead and download a copy for yourself at liftoff.energy.gov. As a reminder, these reports are intended to be living documents updated at a frequent cadence. And so we welcome your feedback as you dig in. Over the next half an hour, we're going to tick through a couple of things together. Uh, first, we'd like to walk through the report at a glance. Second, we're going to discuss the community benefits and jobs implications of clean hydrogen. And then finally, we'll wrap up with a deep dive on some of the specific analyses that you'll find in the liftoff report. So let's get started first, uh, walking through some of the high level findings of the report. So as many of you are aware, the US clean hydrogen market is poised for rapid growth. 
accelerated by DOE's hydrogen hub funding, the hydrogen production tax credit or PTC, DOE's hydrogen earth shot, and decarbonization goals across both the public and private sectors. Achieving commercial liftoff will enable clean hydrogen to play a critical role in the nation's decarbonization strategy. To make sense of what can be a complicated value chain and certainly complicated if you're new to clean hydrogen, let's start on the left-hand side here and we'll work our way across. Beginning with production, the first thing to note is the sheer size of the clean hydrogen production opportunity. We produce almost no clean hydrogen domestically today. By 2030, there's an opportunity to produce as many as 10 megatons per year. That number rises to 50 megatons per year by 2050, consistent with the DOE National Clean Hydrogen Strategy and Roadmap. Next, I wanna point out the recent acceleration we've seen in the clean hydrogen market. One of the most exciting aspects of working on this report has been tracking project announcements over the last few months. From August to December of last year, more than five megatons of production were announced. And we're well on our way to hitting 10 megatons a year by 2030. In fact, if we add up all production project announcements through the end of 2022, as many as 12 megatons of clean hydrogen production have been announced to date. It's important to note that most of these projects have not taken final investment decision, and many have not secured long-term offtake agreements. And so we need to do everything that we can across the public and private sectors to ensure that these projects make it through investment committee. And that means ensuring that projects secure long-term offtake. It also means scaling up manufacturing and supply chains so that we can achieve our expected production cost decreases while the hydrogen PTC is still active. And so that's the third piece that I wanna emphasize here. We know that as production scales up, so too will our supply chains. A critical part of achieving cost decreases will be growing manufacturing capacity for things like electrolyzers, as well as for enabling components like tube trailers and hydrogen storage tanks. At the same time, we all recognize that we need to grow the clean hydrogen workforce to keep pace. Today through 2030, declines in electrolyzer capex will be one of the critical drivers of cost reductions for electrolytic hydrogen. And so we'll spend some time on those details in a few minutes. And finally, as this audience is likely aware, production is essential, but it's only part of the equation. Without low cost production, the rest of the clean hydrogen economy can't accelerate fast enough to meet our objectives. And so that means that production is the first and essential domino that needs to fall to ensure liftoff of this entire value chain. And so we, while we have significant momentum, we can't afford to take our foot off the accelerator. We need to see expected cost reductions while credits are active so that the market can be self-sustaining when credits expire. But to grow at the pace required, we'll also need to address challenges and opportunities related to scaling midstream infrastructure and securing demand. And so we'll jump into those buckets next. If I move on to that middle bucket, midstream infrastructure, we've heard from the private sector that the cost of midstream infrastructure can be a challenge for use cases where supply and demand aren't co-located today. Even when hydrogen production costs are low, Midstream and downstream costs can be as expensive as production on a levelized basis. However, we also know that recent commercially ready developments have the potential to meaningfully lower costs. By 2030, industry estimates that multiple methods of hydrogen distribution and storage can become affordable if state-of-the-art technologies are commercialized at scale. Some of these components have already been deployed domestically and we simply need to expand their use. In other cases, things may be in the demonstration phase and are expected to be ready prior to 2030. As David mentioned, DOE hydrogen hubs will also play a critical role in infrastructure expansion. $7 billion in federal funding for regional clean hydrogen hubs will advance new networks of shared hydrogen infrastructure and help buy down risk for first-of-a-kind projects. We also know that for the clean hydrogen economy to reach its full potential, we need open access infrastructure. Open access infrastructure would help to drive a competitive market by helping producers and off takers, both small and large, to access the advantages of infrastructure scale, including via pipeline delivery and salt cavern storage. As we expand our midstream infrastructure, the investment case for those more distributed use cases will continue to improve, helping the clean hydrogen economy expand 
from what are largely co-located use cases today to more distributed use cases going forward. And so finally, that brings us to the far right hand side of the page and talking about downstream applications and end use. As many of you are aware, clean hydrogen can help decarbonize more than a dozen end markets, particularly in sectors that have few other decarbonization options, such as industrial and chemical uses, as well as heavy duty transportation. In the near term, clean hydrogen is expected to replace today's carbon intensive hydrogen, especially in those industrial and chemicals use cases, including for ammonia and for oil refining. These use cases are frequently co-located which means they face fewer costs related to midstream infrastructure. And so today through 2030, you'll see that high carbon intensity hydrogen transition to lower carbon intensity sources. However, to hit the next inflection point in domestic liftoff, we need to unlock other markets as well. This includes transportation markets such as heavy duty trucking, aviation fuels, and maritime fuels. In the coming years, the build out of new midstream infrastructure will reduce the delivered cost of hydrogen, improving the business case for more nascent end use applications, including those in the transportation sector. These markets are large and they often have high willingness to pay. Use cases like heavy duty trucking may also help to pull infrastructure out of those co-located production and offtake clusters and into more distributed regional networks. Long-term, Numerous clean hydrogen end markets need to be self-sustaining by the time IRA credits expire. That means we need to hit production cost downs and have scaled low cost infrastructure. To progress towards the self-sustaining market, projects also need to secure long-term offtake. Bolstering demand and unlocking long-term offtake will help to support the current proliferation of hydrogen project announcements and help them reach final investment decision. And most importantly, offtake helps create the demand pull and market certainty to speed up private investment in things like midstream infrastructure. For some sectors, we recognize that market specific interventions may also be needed to further accelerate liftoff. In some cases, these changes may be a regulatory thing at a state or federal level. For example, we have seen the power of the low carbon fuel standard in driving the business case for fuel cell electric vehicles in the state of California. In other instances, market intervention may look like R&D or building up manufacturing scale to achieve liftoff. The report goes into further detail on which markets these interventions are relevant for, so we won't spend time on that here. And finally, while not a focus of this report, we acknowledge that export markets represent a very attractive opportunity to improve the investment case for domestic assets and to ensure their high utilization. And so with all this in mind, I'll go ahead and pass it to my colleague, Jill, who will walk us through the jobs and community impacts of clean hydrogen. Thanks, Hannah. So this slide covers information about energy and environmental justice as it relates to energy infrastructure broadly, as well as some specific considerations for hydrogen. This is important to cover because the ways in which first of a kind energy infrastructure projects impact and are impacted by society can influence market liftoff, which means that considering social impact is key not only to the success of each individual project, but also to the level of social acceptance and ultimately the broader adoption of these new technologies. So as first movers, early players have an outsized role in shaping whether the clean energy transition is supported by and supportive of communities and workers across the country. New technologies have the opportunity to contribute to a more equitable and just future or follow entrenched patterns of racial and socioeconomic injustice seen in our current energy system. With much of the country's existing energy and industrial infrastructure located in communities of color, tribal communities, and working class communities, energy production and use has posed outsized health, environmental, and social risk to these groups while also creating a complicated economic legacy. But clean, excuse me, clean hydrogen projects have the potential to generate real benefits for the health, um, environments, and economies of frontline communities, which includes the creation of good jobs. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. However, when communities and workers are not involved in decision-making on projects that impact their lives, a lack of community or labor acceptance can pose risks to project success community and worker-led pushback can lead to costly delays or even cancellations. 
but a pro proactively accounting for societal considerations and impacts can minimize community acceptance risk and project implementation risk while maximizing opportunities for quality jobs, community benefits, and positive host community relationships. To support this, project developers can meaningfully engage with impacted communities, tribes, and labor unions early and often to support real accountability and transparency. They can assess and address energy and environmental justice concerns and opportunities, focus on creating quality jobs and investing in career track workforce develop development and supporting diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And for hydrogen specifically, there are some common energy and environmental justice concerns developers need to be aware of and address from the outset. These are covered in more detail in the report, and these may evolve over time and depending on the community in question, but I'll just mention a few of them now. One is the safety of production in midstream hydrogen and carbon dioxide infrastructure or carbon infrastructure. Communities have already expressed concerns, for example, about groundwater contamination and pipeline leakages. Another concern is the health impact of production and end use for hydrogen technologies, including the introduction of new or additional criteria air pollutants to nearby communities. Also communities, especially frontline communities looking to phase out existing fossil fuel infrastructure have expressed concern about the continued operation of polluting facilities in their area. So for example, this might look like using hydrogen to decarbonize a facility that might otherwise shut down and doing this that could extend the operational life of that facility and ultimately its ongoing operation could lead to the continued emission of harmful criteria air pollutants. By engaging seriously and early with questions of equity, labor rights, and justice, project investors, developers, managers, and off-takers can help support the country's equitable energy transition, ensure a more just distribution of impacts, foster innovation, protect and support workers, remediate legacy harms, and ultimately limit the damage from climate change for generations to come. The next slide, I'll talk about quality jobs and investing in the American workforce. So hydrogen has the potential to create 100,000 new direct and indirect jobs related to new capital projects in clean hydrogen infrastructure, as well as about 120,000 direct and indirect jobs in operations and maintenance of hydrogen assets. However, the US currently lacks a sufficient, appropriately skilled workforce to manufacture, construct, and operate the volume of hydrogen infrastructure required to meet project demand. The deployment of energy technologies depends on the availability and engagement of a well-qualified workforce. The energy transition may create opportunities to attract and train labor from adjacent industries, helping to minimize worker displacement throughout the energy transition. To build the workforce needed to power the hydrogen economy, employers must attract and retrain, excuse me, retain workers and hire, with higher wages and benefits, as well as opportunities for career advancement and training. Another tool to attract workers is a project labor agreement, which is a pre-hire collective bargaining agreement for construction projects. Project labor agreements or PLAs provide assurances of workforce availability and labor cost certainty that are beneficial to project developers. And also wanna say that building workforce education and training into project management through PLAs and other mechanisms can help expand the pool of qualified workers required um, on other kinds of projects and in doing so help maintain workforce stability even under volatile market conditions. Ultimately, a stable skilled workforce will be critical to support the sustained growth and scalability of the hydrogen economy. I'll pass it back to you, Hannah. Awesome, thanks so much, Jill. Um, so with the last 15 minutes or so, we, we hope you're hanging in there online. Um, we're going to walk through some of the findings in the report, including some of the charts that you'll find in the write-up. Um, we'll go ahead and start with production again, and then we'll move to midstream infrastructure and long-term offtake. And so starting with electrolysis, um, we wanted to illustrate industry expected cost declines for the levelized production cost of clean hydrogen before the PTC credit has been applied. And so on the left-hand side here, you'll see a PEM electrolyzer, on the right hand side, you'll see an alkaline electrolyzer. And I think both examples really capture the fact that the primary cost drivers of the levelized cost of hydrogen are first, clean electricity, um, and second, electrolyzer capex. And near term, electrolyzer capex is critical. So taking a closer look at that you know, dark green portion of the bar, 
you'll see that the biggest near-term opportunity for cost declines today through 2030 will be from decreasing electrolyzer capex costs. And this really emphasizes the importance of building up our domestic supply chain while the hydrogen PTC is active so that we can reach economies of scale in electrolyzer manufacturing and see cost reductions within the credit window. And as that scale up is taking place, the PTC should remove near-term unit cost pressure for clean hydrogen producers. And in some cases, projects that qualify for the full PTC may even see negative production costs. So spending a moment longer on electrolyzer capex, the report also highlights a range of electrolyzer technologies that are currently deployed or under development, as well as industry-informed estimates about the uninstalled capex costs today through 2030. You'll notice that electrolyzer capex may fall between 60 to 80%, depending on the technology. And as noted, these costs are informed by industry interviews and third-party reports, so we'll be updating them frequently as both supply chains and manufacturing scale evolve. From our interviews with the private sector, we know that these cost targets are both ambitious and achievable. Similar to the evolution of solar and wind manufacturing, productized modular systems with standard inputs and outputs can help drive down costs and increase manufacturing scale, helping the supply chain to mature. In addition, continued R&D will be necessary to reduce critical mineral loads and to address material sourcing for some types of equipment. For example, the availability of iridium and PEM electrolyzers or their reliance on PFAS ionomers. Jumping now to reformation-based approaches, we similarly evaluate the levelized cost of hydrogen production for reformation-based projects. Reformation-based projects with carbon capture and storage, or CCS, have lower initial unsubsidized levelized costs. But these pathways have already seen more significant learning curve cost downs. They also remain sensitive to natural gas prices, which you can see here drive up to half of levelized costs. CCS, on the other hand, is just beginning to be deployed at scale. Moderate future cost reductions could be driven by a couple of things, including more modular CCS technology produced in greater quantities, as well as next generation CCS technology with higher performance or lower costs. You'll find significantly more detail related to production in the report, as well as an upcoming liftoff report dedicated to carbon management. I wanna emphasize that we're well on our way to knocking down production costs this decade, and that this is the first and essential step to developing the domestic clean hydrogen economy. If we take a step back for a moment, we see that the investment landscape starts to tell a very similar story. This figure tracks publicly announced U.S. investments through the end of the year 2022. We know that many more projects have been announced since January 2023. These projects will be reflected in the next update of the report. And please drop us a line if when you see the project tracker, you don't see yours listed. As of end of year 2022, the hydrogen economy would require an additional $85 billion to $215 billion of investment to scale through 2030. As you can see on the left-hand side, we're well on our way in terms of spinning up private investment in the production opportunity. But as noted, most of these projects have not reached final investment decision, and most have not secured long-term offtake. And therefore, we can't afford to take our foot off the accelerator as we need to see clean hydrogen production scale so that we achieve cost downs while credits are active, because low cost clean hydrogen is what will enable the rest of the value chain to materialize. Taking a look at that middle bar, that's the capital gap today through 2030. The hydrogen economy needs more midstream and end use infrastructure to continue to lift off. As much as half of the investment required through 2030 will be for midstream or end use infrastructure as shown by that dark green and then neon green bar above it. And then up to one third will be needed for net new clean energy production to power electrolysis. And so as we start to think about what it would take to unlock the rest of the hydrogen value chain, I'll pass it to my colleague Jay who will walk us through the considerations and opportunities for midstream infrastructure. Thank you, Hannah. One common question from project developers is how to think about midstream infrastructure. There's no single distribution method that works for every project's type. So off takers that are not co-located with producers or connected via a pipeline must evaluate the cost efficacy of gaseous versus liquid trucked hydrogen for their particular use cases. 
To illustrate this point, the figure shown demonstrates some of the distance and volume trade-off considerations. Over short distances in a region on the order of 250 miles or less, compressed gaseous hydrogen is the lowest cost method of moving hydrogen, as illustrated by the dark green shading in the chart here. This pathway could be vital to lowering the cost of regional hydrogen delivery until regions reach sufficient scale of hydrogen use to allow for economic pipelines. Next slide, please. Spending a moment on these distribution methods, this figure illustrates the levelized cost of different options, including gas phase trucking, liquid hydrogen trucking, and dedicated pipeline transport. You'll find in the report also some text exploring hydrogen and natural gas blending. This figure represents the 2030 levelized cost, including compression and liquefaction. For gas phase trucking, cost reductions are driven by new compressor systems and new hydrogen tube trailer materials and designs. Liquid hydrogen remains viable for long distance trucking. And you'll notice pipeline transport costs are very low, but this requires significant scale on the order of a hub to become economical. But most importantly, pipelines must be open access for them to benefit the hydrogen economy and to permit growth of both production and offtake. Otherwise, these low costs will never be realized. Next slide, please. Moving on to storage, we evaluated numerous methods, including gaseous, liquid, and salt cavern storage for up to a week or more of storage. Geologic storage with pipeline connections is the lowest cost storage option. But the production scale required for pipelines and the limited geological availability will reduce access to these options before 2030. Until the open access pipelines and storage are available, gaseous systems allow renewable developers to off-grid hydrogen production, bypassing interconnection queues to deliver electricity to markets as hydrogen. Gaseous compression systems are compatible with this intermittent production from renewables, making them ideal for this off-grid production. This will allow gaseous systems for regional scale of hydrogen and more rapid spoke development around hubs. However, right now the equipment supply chains for hydrogen distribution are developing. Manufacturing capacity of these equipments needs expansion. Given that BIL included new domestic content preference and requirements for certain projects supported by DOE financial assistance, urging suppliers to install domestic production capacity will be beneficial. And now I can hand it back to Hannah. Awesome, thank you, Jay. All right, so so five minutes more. Uh, stay with us here. We're we're almost done. Um, now that we've spent some time on both production and midstream infrastructure, I think it's important to take a look at how this whole value chain starts to come together. This figure illustrates potential 2030 cross across the value chain if advances in distribution and storage technology are commercialized. Note that the end use levelized cost is highly dependent on both utilization as well as project siting. These costs are not meant to capture the entire range of value chain outcomes, but instead to illustrate a potential 2030 state if we deploy technology that we know is commercially viable today or is soon to be commercially ready before the end of the decade. This chart is quite busy and so I won't spend too much time on it during this session. However, would encourage you to use this figure to choose your own adventure starting with production costs on the left-hand side, and then moving to midstream storage and distribution infrastructure in the middle of the frame, you can add up a delivered cost of hydrogen, and then compare on the right-hand side the end-use willingness to pay for a particular application. With the time remaining, we wanted to focus on the final core pillar of the hydrogen value chain, securing long-term offtake and understanding what the demand landscape could look like. This figure illustrates some, but certainly not all, of the many sectors where clean hydrogen can play a role in decarbonization. You'll see that we've broken them into a few categories, including industrial and chemicals, transportation, heating, and some power sector applications. This is not an exhaustive list. Some NU segments were not analyzed, and those are noted in the green box. But looking at the total addressable market, just for clean hydrogen production as a feedstock, you'll see that it could represent an 80 to $150 billion opportunity by 2050. Near term, you'll see that the largest demand pools are in those chemicals and industrial uses, including sectors like ammonia and oil refining. These sectors are already co-located, so they don't face some of the midstream infrastructure challenges we mentioned previously. 
and they already use hydrogen today. So they will be switching from a high carbon intensity hydrogen to a lower carbon intensity hydrogen by 2030. As we extend out beyond 2030, you'll see things like transportation demand begin to come online. This includes demand from heavy and medium duty vehicles, aviation fuels, and marine fuels. Transportation could represent an inflection point in domestic demand for a few reasons. These end markets are large and valuable, and willingness to pay is often higher than industrial segments. And finally, transportation use cases could provide some of the market pull to develop regional clean hydrogen networks that are more distributed. I also encourage you to spend some time in the report looking at total cost of ownership. IRA and cost reductions from BIL bring forward the timelines for several hydrogen end uses to be competitive with incumbents when evaluating best in class projects. For the chemical sector, IRA allows direct replacement of high carbon intensity hydrogen with low car carbon intensity hydrogen immediately. And for transportation use cases, heavy duty vehicles combined with things like the low carbon fuel standard and IRA credits should be competitive very soon with the caveat that the refueling infrastructure will also be necessary to operate these vehicles. The report goes into further detail to show a range of projects and scenarios. And don't forget to miss the uh, modeling appendix, which has even more detail. So finally, in conclusion, um, as we piece together the full hydrogen value chain, some common themes and challenges emerge. We've run through many of these over the last half hour. And in fact, many of these surfaced through interviews with you all. So I think none will be huge surprises. But you'll see that long-term offtake and midstream infrastructure are the first two challenges on the left-hand side there. We also call out the need to scale our supply chains um, and the need for projects to be able to access commercial financing, especially commercial debt, as they grow. And finally, as Jill had discussed on prior slides, clean hydrogen will face cross-cutting challenges related to community acceptance and energy and environmental justice. And so this is where we roll up our sleeves and we get to work across the public and private sectors. DOE and its peer agencies have the tools along with the private sector to tackle these challenges together. That includes scaling cost-effective midstream infrastructure, the federal government's $7 billion investment in regional clean hydrogen hubs will catalyze regional demand pools and support cost sharing across distribution and storage resources. We also need to scale up domestic manufacturing capacity and help projects unlock low cost of capital. Scaling clean hydrogen will require a four to 10 X increase in private sector investment capital by 2030. Federal dollars can play a critical role in financing novel first of a kind projects in hydrogen technologies that require scaled deployments to come down the cost curve. And there may also be a need to develop mechanisms that allow for better price discovery, whether that's through bilateral contracts or something that looks akin to a merchant market. Taken together, these initiatives will be critical for liftoff. And so finally, I'll go ahead and pass it to Lucia who will close us out here. Thanks, Hannah. And thank you to our hydrogen team, Hannah, Jay, and Jill. Uh, thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us today for this launch of the Pathways to Commercial Liftoff effort and the deep dive into the Clean Hydrogen Report. Again, all the reports can be found at liftoff.energy.gov. I also want to close by reemphasizing that these reports are meant to be living documents that will be updated as the commercialization outlook for these technologies changes. We look forward to input and feedback from all of you via email at liftoff at hq.doe.gov. This email can also be found on the website. And please do keep an eye out for subsequent webinars on the advanced nuclear and LDES reports, as well as future publications. Thanks again, everyone. <laughs>